Welcome, everybody. I'm very pleased to have Paul Plant as our speaker tonight. Paul has been a member of BUC for almost well, for 17 years, coordinating and uh, recruiting people and managing people in a number of different activities. And he's uh, a BUC coordinator and member of the Lighthouse Board of Directors, where he's a chair of the program committee and congregations host sites. He works at Greening of Detroit, which is one of the activities we support as a senior lead forester and task leader for oh. Habitat for Humanity and the CAS Community Social Services Tiny House Builds. I know Paul chiefly because he's managed, coordinated the uh, SOS South Oakland Shelter Program that uh, once a year has been occupying BUC for one week, and I'm just amazed how he's recruited, managed, scheduled, and planned over 100 volunteers for that activity. And I'm very pleased to uh, have Paul today to speak to us about help for humans. Paul? Okay, it seemed, to... like, it, it seemed like a proper title for humanists, help for humans. <clears throat> Um, so here's what we're going to do. Um, towards the end, we have one hour. So towards the end of this hour, I'm going to ask you two questions. Um, how does your personal humanist value system affect social action and social justice? I know each of you personally, you've all helped with SOS and I see you around church in a variety of activities. Um, and I appreciate your efforts. Um, and the second question I'm gonna ask you is, um, how can you help? Um, so my religion is basically this. Um, so there's three organizations that I work with and it's um, Greening at Detroit, Habitat, Cass Community Social Services, those two I build houses with, and the other one is Lighthouse South Oakland Shelter. I have formulated about 30 questions that you um, would probably like to ask me, rather than me go through it and give you a lecture on what it is. I want to know on these three areas. What are your questions? We don't, we don't have a whole lot of time, so how can I answer what you need to know? My unique perspective on these is I, I've worked on all of these for somewhere between 15 and 25 years. So what nitty-gritty questions do you have that um, you might not find in the, um, in the write-ups on this stuff? So I'm going to turn the floor over to you guys. Unmute everybody, and um, if you have a if you have a question ready to go, uh, Larry, you can control this, or you can just raise your hand. Well, I'd rather, the, I'd rather use the I'd rather use the Zoom hand. Right? You go up to the participants and click on the hand that's raising your hand. If you don't see the icon, click on your name and then raise your hand. Um, but everybody's unmuted right now. Paul, I, ha I have one question. If I can start, can you hear me? Oh, wait a minute, hold on. Yeah. Can you hear me, Larry? Yes, yes I can. can. Uh, may I ask uh, Paul to repeat once more? I, I got the, um, you know, you work on Habitat for Humanity and you work on the SOS. And what was the third one? Well, I build houses. I build with Habitat for Humanity. That's in um, Pontiac and Detroit. And I also build houses with CAS Community Social Services. They have a whole range of services um, in the CAS corridor. And you may have heard of tiny houses. I do the interiors of those houses. Okay, thank you. Uh, Larry Larson has his hand raised. Larry? Yeah, um, Paul, are you somewhat new to Lighthouse? I know they merged with uh, SOS, uh, South Oakland Shelter. Um, 
are you, you're familiar, you're on the board of directors at Lighthouse, I believe. Yes. Um, <clears throat> they sent me an urgent uh, solicitation saying that uh, Detroit has been the hardest hit in the entire nation, or one of the nation worst hit. And they've given a lot of uh, layoffs. And they, uh, they're trying to provide home delivery of food and supplies to seniors and families without transportation, providing food boxes to families in need through three di distribution sites. And they also claim that there's 2,200 children that are homeless in Oakland County. How, ba how bad is it now since we've had this uh, uh, pandemic uh, situation? It seems like if people are laid off and they're desperately poor and then laid off, they, they must be pretty desperate. Is there any safety net for them? Okay, so SOS um, combined with <clears throat> Lighthouse of Pontiac we have a new name called Lighthouse Michigan. Lighthouse had operated pantries in Oakland County. That was their claim to fame more than anything. Uh, SOS ran shelters. When we combined, we expanded everything that we were doing. Um, there are roughly 10, 10,000 homeless in the Tri-County area, and that probably will get worse in the near future until there's a vaccine for COVID. Um, you are familiar with BUC hosting approximately 30 men, women, and children. <coughs> 52 churches did that for SOS. We've taken the 30 and we've expanded it to roughly 60. We can't host at churches because we can't put all these people at risk in one location for both them and the host congregations. We are currently renting motel rooms at, we're, we're renting approximately 60 rooms in motels in Oakland County they're costing us roughly $1,000 per room per month, plus our services, food, and odds and ends of other things. Um, did that, Larry, did that get every question you had on the table? Oh, but one other thing. We're, we're also, also one other thing you asked. How are we feeding all of these people and all the homeless in the Tri-County area? We have expanded our pantry to feeding almost 2,000 people a day, get that number, um, through partnership with Oakland University. And um, one of the churches that's adjacent to SOS, it's called St. David's Episcopal. Um, okay, let me stop there. That get you, Larry? Yeah, I got other questions, but I want uh, other people to get a chance to ask too. I have, a, I have a question. I really, what I wanted to know, what is the definition of a humanist? I'm not a religious person. And I'm just wondering how, what defines a humanist and what does the organization look like? So here's uh, Fred, I'm gonna take that on and I'm going to say, um, we're not going to entertain that question until after 8 p.m. because I wanna answer questions associated with um, uh, tonight's, tonight's okay. topic. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay, but uh, I'll you stick around at eight o'clock yeah, you know, and uh, um, I'm gonna have the two Larrys answer that for you. I, I just wanna say last, our last meeting two weeks ago was entirely on that subject of the journey to become humanist. Five of us spoke about that, and that session was recorded. And you can uh, listen to it on uh, face the Facebook channel of BUC or on the BUC 
Facebook page or the YouTube channel or Facebook. I want I should have mentioned at the beginning this meeting is being recorded. And if you don't want to, only people who speak or will, will be identified. So uh, if, if you're concerned, don't speak. Larry, Anyone else have a question? Um, Larry, uh, if this is being recorded, will I receive royalties from my presentation? <laughs> uh, you'll have to split them with me, though. Uh, the host <laughs> take my cut. Okay, 60-40, buddy. Okay. Um, well, while people are thinking of questions, uh, Paul, um, how does Habitat for Humanity work at all with Humble Design, which Lisa Crawford, our former communications manager, is very active in, and she's spoken about designing, uh, providing the interior design for people who have been homeless and are moving into homes. Does Habitat work closely with them? Yes. Um... One thing that we're very good at, we are probably the largest organization now called Lighthouse Michigan in the state of Michigan. Even at that, we can't do it all. So one of the most important things that we do is refer people to other organizations, especially niche groups, Larry, like that one, to, to help them get established. We'll get them, um, we'll get them a house, but it may be empty and organizations like that um, fill it up. So thanks, that's a good question. Larry, it's Ann Troop, I had a question. Go ahead. I'm interested in more information about how you're dealing with SOS. I, I know it took us like a hundred people to shelter and feed them and if you can't have people being close to each other, I'm wondering where the volunteers and the people come from dealing with SOS and um, who's doing the driving and all those issues that we would have dealt with at the church. Oh, uh, Anne, that's a great question. Um, First of all, congregations will not host for sure until November 1st, which is interesting because that's our week. Right. Whether it will happen November 1st depends on where the virus is at that time. So um, this ties into the end of the hour where I say, how can you help? It takes an extraordinary amount of money to pull this off because currently we have these people in hotel, motel rooms. Again, it's $1,000 a month to do this. When we get the churches, the congregations, it's free. Um, secondly, we have to feed them. How, how are we doing that? Well, um, it's a little bit crazy. The staff that used to do different things is now pressed into service, delivering food, um, driving people if they have emergencies for medical conditions, et cetera. Fortunately, at this point in time, there's no schools. So the 30% of children we take in don't have anywhere to go. Basically, these people are isolated to the motel room that we give them. Um, now, where is the money coming from for all of that that the congregations would generally take care of? Uh, would you like to know? Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm gonna give you round numbers here. 50% of our, uh, let me see. Our assets currently total about $10 million. Our budget is about $5 million per year. The money comes roughly 50% from the government, that would be federal, state, local, 25% from corporations, and 25% from fundraisers and individuals like you. So I'll, I'll um, I'll extend that just a little. 
If you want to help at the end of all this, donate to Lighthouse Michigan, and that money will go towards supporting these people until we host November 1st. Does that answer you, Ann? Um, yes, but it doesn't tell me enough about um, volunteers who are driving people or it seems like you need more people. But secondly, I'm astonished at the amount of money you have and at the costs that you see. I didn't realize it was all in the millions. It's um, okay. So um, to a large extent, the guests are isolated to their rooms because we don't have enough people to get them around. And because of the virus, we don't want them to get around. We are taking volunteers, but um, I apologize for this comment, but we're not taking any of you. We will take your money, but we're not taking anyone over the age of 60. Um, so, um, and because of that, we don't want to be responsible for your health. Um, he, they won't even take me. I've tried to get into a variety of things. Um, I think I was, I was the last volunteer driver at the last church that we were associated with. So mostly we're looking for money. Some people are donating food. Now the problem with food again, too many people handle it. If you give us money, um, instead of giving us a $1 can of corn, we'll get it for 50 cents in a whole case at Costco, and very few people will handle it except for teams of Oakland University students and younger people who deal with it at the university and at St. David's. Um, did I get both of them or did I miss another one, Ann? I can't. Come here. Well, one last question. Are the people that you deal with coming for one month only and then somehow you find someplace else for them to go? Oh, you guys, you that's good questions. Um, we will keep them as long as it takes to find them housing up to three months. That's the original bargain we made with them. At the moment, we're keeping them longer than three months because of the virus but we're still looking for housing. Um, let me branch off of that question to housing. Um, we have a policy that says for homeless people, housing first. What that means is if you don't have a house, if you don't have a address, a stable place to go out from, getting work, doing anything else is an issue. So our first goal, number one, is finding housing. We can't find enough housing. There is not enough low-income housing in the country of the United States, mm. little less in the city and the tri-county area. We, um, we just started to go into the housing business. We have, um, we have 64 mixed-use somewhat low income housing in Ferndale coming online this month, 64 units. Um, we also have, um, we also have in the cards, another 200 units that we're going to try and build in the next three or four years. I'm on that housing committee and these are multi-million dollar establishments. Uh, the one in Ferndale cost us $12 million. Um, and if you want all the details, I can tell you roughly how an organization like us does that. But the reason we did it is we can't get people out of the program because there is no place to send them. So we're building our own. That's probably maybe more than you wanted to know, but it's pretty fascinating we're not only we're not only taking care of the homeless we're in the housing business as well and we're also in the pantry and food business paul you mentioned uh november 1st uh you would uh would be the week for being at 
BUC, but the latest we heard was that BUC won't be open until sometime in February for Easter Sunday services. Have you uh, had got any more information that we would be available in the first week in November? Uh, good question again. Um, the board is already talking about what we're going to do with 52 congregations. Of the 52, six are already gone, okay? Um, we, there's approximately 10 more that I'm going to call at risk. Um, there's congregations like ours that are relatively small. There's congregations that won't be open in time to host, just like Larry, you brought out with BUC. So what are we going to do with these people? And that is still a major open issue because how are we getting $1,000 per room per month plus food, plus social services today? And how will we continue to get that if churches drop out starting November 1st and BUC is probably the first one on that list? So how do we get the money today? Um, our chief operating officer is dedicated currently full time to getting grants, federal, state, local to help pay for this. She is also working full time with corporations to get money from them, um, donations from people like you, etc. Now the question is, when this virus started, everybody was on board, gung ho, we're gonna lick this, uh, I'll give you a buck. When we stretch this out for a year before a vaccine is ready, we don't have an answer to that. Um, we only take 60. <clears throat> we feed a whole bunch of other ones, but these 60, along with a whole bunch of other ones, may very well wind up on the street in a November time frame, and that's winter. So um, there's not a good answer. We're working on it, but I can't give you an answer to that, and that should that scares the hell out of me, to be honest with you. Yeah. Paul, um, we ha we are going to have about twelve people here tonight, which is disappointing. We do have some conflict with the social justice is, is uh, showing a film or talk, having discussion about a film they schedule at the same time. It might be one of the reasons. But how do, how do we get our entire congregation as concerned as you are, and hopefully the, the uh, 11 of us, about the plight of homelessness, homelessness in Oakland County and, and the work the Lighthouse and is doing and SOS and uh, are, are, are you, do you work with this, the environmental, the social environmental justice committee who are involved with race relations and climate control and many other things? Uh, it seems to me this should be one of the priorities of our church as far as social justice is concerned. I do work with them. It is one of their priorities. I have discussed uh, somewhat with Mandy about this. Um, the, um, I'll tell you what other churches are doing to help us out. <clears throat> when your week comes up, first week of November, BUC, um, churches that um, currently would be hosting are supplying food, money, um, some driving, and a variety of help, even though the host church is not hosting. So we have those options as well. And in order to pull that off, I would, I would suggest that um, we need Mandy, or I'm willing to do it as well, to have this conversation at a um, Sunday service, just exactly what this means and what we can do. Um, Unitarians have a reputation for getting involved. We probably need to get really involved in the first week of November 
and, um, and help this thing out. Um, for instance, we've always made all of our own food. We can do that again and, and deliver. We can't deliver it because we're too, most of us are too old. So we're gonna have to get the next generation. Um, the people in this group can make the food, but somebody else is gonna have to deliver it and it's gonna have to go to, if we still have those 60 rooms, it's gonna have to go to those rooms. So it's gonna to have to, um, you can't make one pot of macaroni and cheese. You're gonna to have to make um, 60 Ziploc baggies, whatever it takes. So we're gonna to have to think of a, a workarounds. We're gonna to have to get creative. This is an intelligent group of people we have. We're gonna to have to figure out how to make this work. <clears throat> well, how do we get started? Who, uh, you said, it's up. We have to just have Mandy, Reverend Mandy, make this a priority and have it in a Sunday service. And uh, we have a we have a board of trustees. We have a social and environmental justice committee. We do. Um, all of the above are going to have to get involved, and um, I will press that issue probably sometime in early August. That still gives us August, September, October, three months um, to get our act together and figure out what we're gonna do. Paul, you mentioned at the beginning, you had some questions that you thought should be raised, but you wanted to see what questions we have. Maybe you should ask the next question. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Larry, but if uh, Jean had her hand up and I'm interested, can I go with her first? I, I, I was just going to make a comment. Yeah, I will. We should use the Zoom hand, then I can see who has their hand raised. Do you see, <laughs> Larry, do you see my hand? I'm not that yeah, astute. Your hand is up. The, the reason I'm not using it is because I'm not sure what you mean. But um, anyway, I, I thought today, oh, I've seen it. I thought oh, this format was... There's a little um, thing he's click on and raise your hand. Am I talking or is somebody else talking? I thought this format was great. I mean, you could put those people who ask questions, just plant them in the congregation somewhere. When you have the congregational meeting, I mean, that's much more, um, what do I want to say? I, I can listen much easier and be more interested in this kind of a format where somebody asks you a question. You probably knew this ahead of time. And so you planned it this way, but I thought it was very effective. Thank you. I did it on purpose because um, it's the same as raising a kid. You're always better off when they ask the question than when you give the answer. Yeah, yeah, right. In, in short, Jean, what are you interested in? What, what tweaks you? What would get you involved? Um, I don't want to tell you that. I want you to tell me. Well, you know, I'm, I'm 86 this month, so um, I, I'm one of the oldies that, you know, fears getting involved because of the COVID virus. But um, I, I, I am very interested in donating and, you know, bringing food, things like that, where I'm not in contact with a lot of people. That, that would be wonderful. Um... If you're going to make a donation and make food, we can use it all the time. But I would personally, um, I would recommend you simply ha uh, hang on to all that until the first week in November when we're supposed to host. And then you can make food and donate, um, put that's your money to use against BUC. Yeah, that's why that whole idea of each church doing, you know, giving and donating uh, during their particular time to me sounds so great because that you know if you if you carry it out forever the enthusiasm dies but if each church takes their regular time th that seems like a good idea to me I like uh, Larry Larson you have a question yeah Paul have you heard about the uh, farmers to family food box program it's a uh, fairly new, I guess. It's a USDA program. And uh, on May, May 8th, uh, they approved 198 contracts, totaling $1.2 billion. It's, it's a program where 
uh, businesses purchase food right from the farmers who normally would sell to restaurants. And they, they buy uh, fruits and vegetables and dairy products. And, and then they, the, there's a business that packages these up for, in family sized boxes. And uh, Michigan's got uh, distributors committed to purchase uh, $85 million worth of food boxes across the region. And it's 70, 70 billion more <clears throat> nationwide for, to nonprofit partners. And uh, there was some event on June 30th about this. I don't know what it was. But anyway, it's Americans Helping Americans. And uh, I don't know if you could take advantage of this program or not, but it's, I, I, I still think that there must be a lot of food deprived people in, in Michigan, especially in Detroit. <clears throat> and uh, I don't know, maybe this is a drop in the bucket, but it's it's farmers who can't sell their products to restaurants. So they now they can sell it to uh, businesses that are under contract with the federal, USDA. <clears throat> okay, so here's my answer to that, Larry. I need you to send me an email briefly with that information. Okay. I will forward it to the correct staff member who does our food purchases. They may already be doing that, but if they're not, then thank you for the recommendation. But send me the email because yeah. I need it in writing. Yeah, I will. I'll, I'll do that. And I need as many contacts as you can give me, and I will forward it to the right person. Thank you. I, I, could, uh, I could just mail this article to you that I'm reading from. Um, it's got a lot of de details on it. Can you email it? I don't know. How, maybe Larry Friedman can help me with that, but I, I don't know how to. Oh, just, yeah. Where's the art? It's right here. For the sake of expediency, just drop it in the mail. I'll scan it and send it to the staff. OK. Thank you, though. Okay. Well, well, <clears throat> What, what things haven't we uh, asked you that you think we should have asked you? Um, well, um, okay, here's one. The people that we take in this shelter, do, the, do they deserve our help? Um, why are we helping them? Um, what do you think? Do they all deserve our help? Who would like to answer that question? I would. I would. There's uh, <clears throat> 2,200 children that are homeless. If we were the parents, do you think we would want to help them? Isn't it pretty obvious that uh, if you have any heart at all, you'd be concerned about <clears throat> homeless children and food deprived people. The average age is nine years old mm -hmm. for the children. And that's just Oakland County. <clears throat> um, Brad, you have a question. Well, sure, I guess this relates to the uh, <clears throat> how can we help. Um, Paul, thanks for your time tonight. My uh, experience with the people that I have come in contact with that think differently than us, when I've been able to get them mm -hmm. more uh, uh, closer, I guess, to a story, then they, they no longer think, well, those are people that don't matter. Those are people that are just not trying, uh, but rather stories of uh, folks that, that uh, were 
were trying and then had their uh, income kicked out from under them? Are there ways that, uh, I, I guess, more ways to get people closer and try to outline those tonight? That was earlier question I guess I had. Try to uh, connect people to be able to help other than uh, just donating and then uh, you know, sitting <clears throat> back. Um, so you've, you've given some sources tonight. Um, <clears throat> I think Lighthouse and a few others to uh, to work with. I'm also of the age group that might be encouraged from some personal involvement in uh, some of the day-to-day -day activities, but would still like to, uh, to help out further. Okay, so your, your question is, how can I help? Yes. Um, um, I would say, again, we are tasked with hosting the first week of November. Um, I will take your macaroni and cheese, your monetary donations, um, what, um, whatever we come up with, um, probably as a social justice committee with Mandy and whoever else wants to participate. There's, um, we have a whole group of leaders, um, BUC, SOS, um, we're going to need your help and everyone else's to do the best we can without hosting at our facility to take care of approximately 60 men, women, and children. So um, get your thoughts together, save your pennies, um, dig out your old mac and cheese recipes and, and get ready <laughs> because we're coming. Um, let me let me answer part of a question here. Who are these people and they do they deserve our help? So the people we get in this program, we get children who obviously by no fault of their own are there and that's about one third of our people. Uh, the other two thirds adults, we get um, battered women, we get mentally and physically handicapped people who the government has never adequately taken care of. We get military people. Um, we get just plain people down on their luck. Um, and to be honest with you, we get some scam artists. Let me define that. Being the largest organization in the state of Michigan, and getting grants from a variety of federal, local, state locations, we are not at liberty to um, choose who we want. And that makes sense because each church, you can't choose a black, you can't choose a Jew, you can't choose a Unitarian. We're all people. So the government says, if I give you a buck you take the first 60 people that come through the door with the exception, there are exceptions. We take no one who's an alcoholic. We take no one who's on drugs. We test people every day. And if they are, after they get in the program, we throw them out. That's not who we're looking for, okay? Um, but basically we have to take everyone. And yes, in my, I don't know, 17 years or so of working with SOS, we have scam artists coming through here. There are people who have family in the Tri-County area. They should be living with them. They should be supporting them, et cetera. Now, um, that's the honest truth of it, but here's the, how, that, how this is related. They make up a relatively small percentage of the people we do serve. No organization is perfect. I don't care if it's Ford Motor Company, the federal government, Birmingham Unitarian Church. Everybody has an element of waste in the operation they do. The bottom line is what we do far outweighs the waste that we perpetrate. Okay, so don't think we're perfect. We ain't. Uh, we're not about being perfect. 
We're about as being as good as we can be and taking care of as many people as we can. Okay? Probably fun. Okay, that's it. I'd like to raise my hand. I don't quite see how to do it on, on the Zoom. We'll just talk. Yeah, I'm, yeah, you're I, unmuted. But. Yeah, okay. I just want a question about the, the eviction. You're like, they have these uh, books is written about the eviction problem, like Minneapolis, the 40% every year people are evicted from the homes. Uh, is this a lot of the problem that, that you see people in? And is there anything that your organizations can do about the eviction problem? This is part of the problem, David. There, uh, we do not specialize in that, so we do not get involved in evictions. We just take them after they're out, uh -huh. but we don't get involved in, um, in trying to keep them. Well, I'm going to take that back. Uh, we don't get involved in the legal concept of that, but we do have government grants and money allocated to keep people in their house. So if you're not yet homeless, you can approach South Oakland Shelter, Lighthouse, Michigan, and if approved, we will and can give you some money to pay rent, pay utilities, help keep you in that house um, if there's light at the end of the tunnel. We, we can't do that for years, but we can do that for months. If there's a transition that will get you back into a job, um, if there's a transition that will, um, let's say you're old and there's a transition to get you into social security benefits, we supply money to do that. We don't have lawyers on the staff. Uh, we, do have, um, we do have three or four lawyers on the board of directors. So we, get, we have some of these discussions, but we don't work in that, uh, in that vein. But one other thing for all of you, um, Larry likes you to, to, to do this by computer, but you can just do this and Larry will find you. <laughs> looks, like, looks like Larry Larson is doing that. Okay. Uh, Larry, you got a question? Yeah. <clears throat> I know you uh, would like us to contribute to uh, Lighthouse Michigan, but <clears throat> I'm sure you have other uh, agency, community organizations you like to see uh, survive too, like uh, Gleaners uh, distributes uh, to 70 distribution sites. They take uh, food, I guess, from grocery stores that are um, about ready to be dis dis uh, despoiled. <clears throat> and uh, what are what are the some of the agencies that you just want to promote? Uh, I was thinking of Focus Hope, for example. Um, the, and, and, the, and Gleaners and Forgotten Harvest. <clears throat> uh, gleaners and Forgotten Harvest both donate food to. Our, our facility in Oakland, at Oakland University. So we already get stuff from them. Um, the, the only other organizations I was talking about tonight uh, is Greening of mm -hmm. Detroit. Um, let me stop there a minute. Um, no, my question is, what, what, what community organizations do you uh, like, to, would like us to support if, with donations? Um, I only, work with four of them uh, and I would prefer that you did not give any of your money to anyone other than those four. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and if you if you really if you're really interested in donating and I've, I've made this point before um, small unmarked bills and a plain white envelope delivered to my address would be very beneficial to me if not them. Uh, Larry Friedman on 10%. Yeah. Um, now, please Paul, don't, you please don't take me seriously on that one, but we got to inject some humor here tonight. Right, okay. right. <clears throat> now, Paul, you mentioned uh, Greening of Detroit, and uh, we, we sort of 
left them aside. Can you tell us more about what that organization does and how you're involved with them? Which one again, Larry? Greening for Detroit. Okay, Greening of Detroit. Um, um, that's an interesting one. I mentioned earlier that the largest organization of its type in Michigan is Lighthouse Michigan. The flip side of that is two organizations that I work for that went bankrupt, belly up. One of them is Greening of Detroit and the other one is Habitat for Humanity of Detroit. Why did they go belly up? What happened? Uh, because everything out here, including BUC, runs on money. Both of those organizations, um, Greening of Detroit, um, had a lot of contracts with the city of Detroit to plant trees. The city of Detroit decided that they had different priorities and they no longer paid us to plant trees. So we do have contracts again, but the only thing we're do, we do two things primarily. We plant trees in the city parks, not in the neighborhoods, uh, which is what we used to do mostly. And we also educate people. And this is one of the most important things we do. So in order to keep people from being homeless, <clears throat> they need to have a job. We take um, 20 um, people, 20 adults from usually 100 applicants. We take a two month period of time and we train them to be a forester. So if you're familiar with companies like Davy that do most of the utility work in the Wayne County, Oakland County area, we train these people to get jobs with those people. And so far, every two months, we kick out 20 people and every one of them gets a job someplace with Davy, um, nurseries, um, the city of Detroit, whatever. So those are things that we do, but we're only a fraction of what we used to be before we lost our contracts. Uh, but um, BUC was supposed to have a Sunday church collection shared, and that was supposed to buy wheelbarrows for greening. That never happened. Um, maybe it will in the future. So anyway, greening um, really went out of business and we are back. Um, I work with them every week, but we do not take volunteers, again, because of COVID. So the trees we plant, the stuff we do is relatively limited because it's only, um, um, it's only the foresters like myself and the staff, a relatively small staff that's still working. Um, the other, um, Habitat, for, Habitat for Humanity, Detroit one of the biggest organizations in, in the United States and Habitat is worldwide, they went out of business. So what happened was in 2008 and beyond when people lost their jobs, Habitat was reluctant to have them lose their house. So we took over the payments of their houses. We, we gave them literally a mortgage. That's the way you would understand it. Habitat took the mortgages on quite a number of houses. The problem was when uh, 10 or 12, literally, of those houses um, could not pay the mortgage, we held it. Guess what happened from a monetary standpoint? Um, we went out of business, uh, which is wildly unfortunate. We are still not building new houses. We're, um, we're helping out in communities, um, rebuilding some houses, uh, fixing up houses, but we have not built a house in the city of Detroit for two years now. And before that, um, we had built in one community alone by Gross Point, we had built 130 houses until we went bankrupt and we haven't built another one in that location. So, um, now the other, the other thing is CAS Community Social Services. <clears throat> we do, we build tiny houses. The, the services are everything. They employ people, they have homeless people, they have food pantries, but they also build houses. 
corporations literally buy the house, people purchase them, um, uh, contractors do the exterior. So we're talking about framing, cement, plumbing, roofing, siding. I do the interior, so that would be uh, trim, base, um, moldings, uh, um, doors, uh, painting, anything you can think of that puts an interior on a house. Now, thanks to COVID, we haven't built any houses since COVID started either because we can't have volunteers to do the interiors and there's uh, other priorities for the contractors. So an awful lot of things are dead in the water until we fix this virus problem. Well, it's, it's getting close to uh, eight o'clock, which we promised Paul would end the meeting at eight. And if no one else has a question, I have a couple of announcements. First of all, this has been an extremely inspiring weekend for humanists and Unitarians. I mean, it started at four o'clock yesterday with the annual meeting of the Unitarian Universalist Humanist Association, where there were, I think, about 69 people from all over the country, and they all weren't Unitarians. There were several from the ethical culture societies around the country. Humanist Judaism was represented. This is not a Unitarian organization. It started as the Fellowship of Religious Humanists by a, a former minister of BUC, Lester Mondale, and two of the most prominent people who helped get it started were Sherwin Wine and Bob Marshall. And uh, Bob, their names were mentioned. And then this morning, we had over 500 people attend the uh, statewide Unitarian service. I hope all of you attended. It was very inspiring and beautiful. But I said, nothing has inspired me more than hearing Paul discuss what he's doing and what we all should be doing to help humanity and help humans. It's, it's really uh, very inspiring. Next, the next meeting is going to be two weeks from tonight. And I think it will help answer Fred's question about what, what is humanism. The speaker will be Ed Sharples, past president, twice of the BUC. He's been a, he's a retired professor of English and literature and dean of the department at Wayne State University and has been involved in so many different activities. He's been a pastoral associate. He's talked on the pulpit and uh, of course been active in our music program. And his topic is going to be the intersection of humanism and religion. And there's no one better qualified. I know that whenever there's a need in BUC for a speaker, a, a master of ceremonies or an auctioneer, the first person we think about is Ed Sharples. So we're very fortunate that he's going to talk to us two weeks from tonight about the intersection of humanism and religion. And I hope you will all attend. And if there are no further, are there any further comments or questions? Yeah, I, th I think Paul said we could uh, stay after eight o'clock <clears throat> and ask questions. So I, I, is that true, Paul? You can stick around for a while? Sure, if you can afford the overtime. Ah. <laughs> <clears throat> Well, we'll have to wait for the first week in November see how much money we get, Paul. Uh, my, my voice is just about gone, so. Um, I was wondering if you got any uh, financial support from the National Alliance to End Homelessness. They, uh, I, I got a letter from the Charity, Charity Watch saying they rated them A plus, one of the top rated agencies. Uh, the National Alliance to End Homelessness. Do, do they help uh, Lighthouse at all? Uh, I don't know. Again, if you're talking about specifically who donates to us like that, um, if you're interested in that <clears throat> answer, you would have to send it to me and I will forward it to um, the, uh, we, have a, we have a really great finance guy um, and I'm not sure where everything comes from. We do talk about these things at the board of directors, but we don't, um, we don't get too much into all the individual sources like that. Um, <clears throat> so, um, 
Are there any any other? Um, yeah, any, Lillian, any other? Uh, <clears throat> Lillian has her hand raised. Go ahead, Lillian. You have to oh, unmute Lillian, yourself. you're on mute. Unmute, lower left. Unmute up on top or on the bottom. Up on top is on up. It says unmute. Lower top left. of your screen should. If, if you're on a computer, it's on the lower left. It says mute, just click on it. Well, if you're on an iPad, it's up okay, on top. No. We're okay. <laughs> okay. There you go. Yeah. We were unmuted before. We just, it just got lost there. Um, I just think we ought to. Uh, cheer, cheer Paul and thank him for all of his incredible service to the congregation and all of us. It's like awesome, incredible. Thank you, Paul. It was a very good session. Paul. Yeah. Well, he told us to send a check to him in a plain white envelope. Okay. Well, you know, you know the, the, the big question though is are you looking for donations now or it would be better to wait until November? <laughs> uh, Lillian, I, th I think you'd be better off waiting to November because I really want BUC to participate. That's what I, that's my question. Great. That's what I assumed. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. we're, we're actually, again, currently we are the first congregation up when we come off the virus. So um, I, uh, we need to figure out what are we going to do with that? We're, we're the first guinea pig of this whole thing. Uh, uh, well, as of now. Yeah. And who knows what November will be anyway. But <clears throat> yeah. The idea of the team effort for the donations is great. So, great. Okay. Why, why are you waiting till November? Right, I've got Fred, Fred Strikey, your hand yeah. is raised. Yeah, this, is, this has been really, really informative to me to because me, I really realize that there's a real problem with this, between this virus and all <clears> the people <throat> that have lost their jobs and are going to be evicted. And, you know, all these people that used to come to SOS, you know, how can you give them the service that even begins to cover what we could give them when we had them operational and, and living at the church itself? It's, yeah. It really has kind of spooked me out as to how, how broad this, this problem is. This is not a small problem, and you just don't, hear all the details. Thanks, Fred. You're exactly right. Well, Sam, I have another question. Go ahead. I have one, I have one more comment. Um, Susan Arnold, are you out there? I see the name. I don't see a picture and you're on mute. I don't know if you actually can unmute. And if you had any questions, I don't want to leave you out. Um, you are an important member of this community. Well, thank you, Paul. I love being recognized. I just didn't want people to have to watch me eat. <laughs> and uh, did you have a, a question? I did. I've been <clears throat> very curious about these tiny houses. Um, are they used for families to live in? <clears throat> or you say corporations purchase them. Are there any, <clears throat> excuse me, deed restrictions or other things for having a tiny house on a plot? Oh, lots of good, really good question. This is really a fun concept. If you, um, if you go down the Lodge Freeway, just past the Davison going downtown, look up to your right, um, off that freeway and you will see our tiny houses. Um, this captures people's imagination. It, um, the houses are 250 to 400 square feet. That's it. That's about the size of most of our bedrooms. Um, we sell the house. So um, we do not stipulate who buys them or how many people they put in them. These are all low income people. Um, we have, um, for each house we build, we literally have thousands of applications. So it's interesting. That's, that, uh, that's the extent of the shortages in, in this, uh, this city. We charge people $1 per square foot for a house that is worth roughly 
fifty thousand oh. dollars. They own it after thirteen years, and roughly oh. they will they will buy that house. They will buy a fifty thousand dollar house for twenty five thousand dollars, and the corporations eat the other half. And these are um, they're small, but they're state of the art. Uh, in terms of um, the environment, heat, solar energy, um, they are as modern as anything you can find in the industry today. Very interesting concept. Lots of fun working on them, but you can picture 250 <laughs> square feet. That's probably the size of you, literally your family room. So when I try and build inside these houses, I can't work with volunteers. Even on a good day, I'm lucky to get one or two volunteers in that house because it's just too small to even work in. So until this virus is over, I'm out of business. Oh, um, do they <clears throat> have kitchens and bathrooms in them? They have, there's only one door and that's the bathroom. Everything else is one large room with that incorporates some um, a kitchen that was probably more suitable to a mobile home. So don't, don't think the suburbs. Um, and they have um, a bed. Some of them have a loft up top where um, they put the bed or storage. None of them have a basement. Um, yep, that's about it. <clears throat> Yes, Susan, you have your hand raised. I do. Um, these small houses have always interested me, and I wonder who is behind them exactly. Is there an organization? I'm sure there's an organization, but it seems like you could have a whole area full of these houses. Is that the intent or? Uh, good, good question. Larger plan. So one of one of the biggest organizations in the city of Detroit is Cass Community Social Services. Before they got involved with housing, they did training, they took care of the homeless, they had pantries, they have, um, they have work sites where they make things and employ people. All of this is in the Cass Corridor. And um, a few years back, again, they couldn't find housing for the people that they were trying to help. So they, they like Lighthouse Michigan, decided the only way we're ever gonna get, make any headway here is to simply do our own housing. So they chose tiny houses, we chose apartments, different approaches. Okay, thank you. Is it still going on? Yeah. Um, um, we're not really actively building right now because of the virus. Okay. But we'll, we, have, um, we have a huge plot of land that we own adjacent <laughs> to our headquarters. And that land is slowly knocking down all the old houses. And on the same land, uh, adding the utilities and building new ones financing behind that is corporations and some grants from the government but so mostly, volunteer. mostly it's corporations picture general motors ford motor company those are two you would know um okay. they simply foot the fifty thousand dollars to build it um and um go, it goes from there um it's it's not the best business prospect you know, I'm going to tell you that um, you you may read up on it. You're not going to hear what I'm going to tell you, but um, it's wonderful for people to own individual houses. But a tiny house is not cost effective, and currently the the process of doing this um, is not sustainable in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, corporations are going to get tired of paying. Um, um, it, the $50,000 that it takes to build these tiny houses is too much money. 
You can yeah. do this with an apartment complex, a duplex, or some, any other concept. The cost per square foot of a tiny house is the worst there is. Mm -hmm. And an apartment complex is a close second. Um, there, there are reasons for that. And I'm gonna stop here because I can, I can bore you with statistics all night. If you're interested, I can keep going because I find it interesting, but I'm weird because I'm an engineer. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay. Does anybody else have uh, comments or questions? Larry? Yeah. <clears throat> Paul, uh, before the uh, pandemic, the children, children in this area were getting two to three meals a day from school. Do you have a, can you figure out, have you figured out how, whether these kids are food, food deprived now? Is there, is there mass, is there starvation or how desperate are things for children? Well, the ones, the ones we take care of are lucky. The ones that go through our pantry, the one to 2000 a day are lucky. I can't tell you, I can only tell you who we're taking care of. I cannot tell you how many are falling through the cracks. Um, this is not a time that you want to be on the street with nobody to help you. But we're not the only, the good news is we're not the only organizations out there. Um, you know, somebody mentioned earlier gleaners. There's a variety of churches that are involved, um, all kinds of different organizations, including Cass Community Social Services. So we're not out here alone. There's a whole bunch, but given everybody out here, um, and timing. How long will people be able to continue, have an interest to continue, etc. if this virus lasts a year? People, uh, people are jumping through hoops today. Will they still in November and December and Christmas uh, without a vaccine? I, I don't know. Does uh, one of the questions is Cass Community Services uh, needing volunteers now, or are there volunteer opportunities at Gleaners or Forgotten Harvest? No <laughs> one that I know of is currently taking volunteers. However, Gleaners, I think, is taking some volunteers with caveats like age, um, face mask, social distancing, number of volunteers that come in. So, so yes, um, as, uh, Lighthouse Michigan is taking volunteers at Oakland University and at St. David's. You have to be younger and um, you have to follow strict guidelines. So yeah, um, there's opportunities. They're just not as many because of social distancing. Thank you, Paul. Well, I think with, uh, as We'll never exhaust this subject, but I think that's about all for tonight. I'm going to close by trying to answer Fred Strachey's question about humanism. And actually, uh, humanism is a philosophy that thinks, that does not believe that our well-being or the well-being of the world depends upon the supernatural being or supernatural deity or whatever. It depends upon how we interact ourselves it depends upon scientific facts and how we treat each other and it doesn't depend upon an afterlife or uh, anything supernatural and there are two types of humanism secular humanism and religious humanism and uh unitary people who are humanists and members of uua or university are religious humanists same as the uh, Society for Humanistic Judaism. So it doesn't deny religion, it just denies that there's something out there beyond <clears throat> ourselves that, that depends upon our well-being and the well-being of the community. Larry, is there anything you want to add to that? No, I was going to say it was a great, a great answer. I, uh, uh, that, that really covers it very well. I'm and very two weeks from tonight, we'll find out about the intersection of humanism and religion. 
and what kind of intersection it is. If there's a stoplight or a police permit or there's a lot of collisions, we'll find out from Ed. And as we know, he is just a dynamic speaker and I hope we have good attendance. Larry, again, I would, Paul, and, uh, Larry, I would add one thing to Fred's question. I am 75% humanist but 25% deist because I like to hedge my bets just in case. <laughs> Very good. <clears throat> That's even better. In fact, in, in August, uh, Reverend Mandy is going to talk to us. And uh, she claims that she's a theist and a humanist. Isn't that right, Larry Larson? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. We're going we're gonna to uh, ask, ask her about that. So we'll find out more about the differences. They're very subtle, I think. Anyway, thank you again, and I'm going to end this meeting, and thanks to all for attending.